This is a work of political and social commentary. The content of this video is not meant for children under the age of 13. Parental discretion is advised. Well now, it's early morning. Time to see what's going on. Let's see here. Well, that's not good. How bad is it in my country? Yeesh. And where I live? Aw, oh, crap. Is anyone else starting their day with their own version of this? Yeah, I thought so. It looks pretty bad. Grab a cup of coffee and a pastry because it's time for some Sunday Roasted Opinions. My recent videos have trended quickly towards news about the outbreak. Rather than concentrating on the downside to this, I've tried to keep things informative and reassuring. Honestly, that's hard given the scope and expansion of this problem, which is why I put out a video about coping with the fear associated with this crisis. So let's review some of the latest news about it. Before we do though, I have a special message for all of the media out there covering this. Members of the press, thank you for covering this crisis. Going out and doing your job anyway because the people need to be informed is exactly the kind of bravery I was talking about in my last video. Bravo! But please remember that covering this story isn't about fear-mongering. It's not about ratings, and it's not about advertising buys. Most businesses just aren't looking to make big ad buys right now anyway, given the fact that they may be closed for several weeks. Remember your training. You have a duty to keep the public informed with factual information. We don't need endless speculation about the motives the people in power have for doing this or not doing that. We also don't need to hear or read people complaining about there being too many press briefings. It wasn't too long ago when your industry was angry that there weren't any press briefings at all, remember? Don't get wrapped around the axle on this. Give us the facts, free from bias, and let us make informed decisions. Now, as for the rest of us. There have been a lot of rumors going around that the government will seize control of everything during this crisis. This has been fostered by people suddenly remembering that the world's leaders actually have that power under emergency protocols everywhere. It's part of basic disaster management to temporarily centralize control of the response to the disaster and redirect essential resources to that disaster. So yeah, in the United States right now, the president has the means necessary to order the production of key items like medical equipment, personal protective equipment, and medicines. He also has the authority to suspend normal protocols in order to foster rapid development, testing, and dissemination of treatments and vaccines to deal with this illness. He could, in fact, declare martial law if necessary. And let's hope that doesn't become necessary. And what the President and the respective departments of the executive branch cannot do alone, Congress can do. What's more, they've been doing it by passing bills which authorize emergency funding for the response and debating a stimulus package to keep the rest of us surviving financially until the crisis is over. They have those powers, folks. But do you really think that they will keep them after the crisis? Um, no. Just no. We are a functioning constitutional democratic republic. While the primary elections may be delayed and are certainly pushed off the front pages right now, the nomination process continues. As of right now, the general elections will still be held in November. If I had to hazard a guess, should this outbreak prove to be still a risk as we approach election day, I think that the respective states will adjust their methods of polling to allow the citizens of the United States to cast their ballots without gathering at precincts. I don't believe at this time that this will be necessary, and I have faith in our system that whatever adjustments need to be made will be made in time. The grocery store inventories in the United States were thoroughly wiped out this week, and I do mean wiped out, as most companies found themselves at times completely out of stock on toilet paper, disinfectant wipes, and other key cleaning commodities. Hours of business have been limited, with many locations blocking out specific periods for people who are immunocompromised to shop when they first open. But why then? Because the stores are getting thoroughly cleaned at the end of every day and re-disinfected in the morning before the customers come in. This makes sure that these customers come into a clean store with the shelves stocked as fully as possible. 
This ensures that Americans who are at greater risk can shop for the things that they need in more safety, and that they can get what they need in fewer trips to the store. Smart thinking. What's also smart thinking is to limit the quantities of key items purchased per visit. Those limits keep people from stockpiling items which are currently in limited supply. Although I would like to point out to America that, contrary to popular belief, we are not about to run out of toilet paper. The toilet paper manufacturers are running at 120% of normal production capacity and have plenty of the resources necessary to make the paper, the boxes to ship it in, and even the little cardboard tubes that it gets rolled onto. And the trucking industry is still rolling too. The Department of Transportation has temporarily suspended the limits on service hours so that truckers can meet the demands for shipping during this crisis. These are just a couple of examples of how the grocery industry is still functioning. I could give many more. Key commodity shortages in this country are largely due to panic buying, not a lack of supply. The only items likely to remain in short supply are items which have to be imported, like white truffle oil and other foods only produced in a specific location overseas. Those aren't staple foods here either. Our staples are all produced in great quantities domestically. There are countries where sufficient quantities of basic groceries are not produced domestically. We will have to keep our food and other basic commodity shipments going to those countries, and that means that the railroads and cargo shipping companies will have to keep transporting them. We'll have to employ some serious safety protocols to make certain that the virus isn't being shipped along with those goods, but America feeds much of the world, and those shipments must keep rolling. That also means that farmers have to get their crops planted and tended. It means that raw materials production like timber and mining have to keep in production in order to feed manufacturing, especially critical manufacturing like making N95 masks and medical ventilators. And that means that we have to keep as much of our population at work as possible while protecting them from as much risk as possible. Which is why much of America has now shut down regular school classes and put as many office workers as possible on work-at-home assignments. It's why events have been canceled and the travel and tourism industries have basically shut down as well. These are also significant industries and the primary source of income for many, many people. Travel and tourism account for about 3% of U.S. GDP, 10% of U.K. GDP, 4% of EU GDP, and so on. And as the global markets finally recovered from the Great Recession, it looked as if travel and tourism live entertainments and attractions, and related industries were going to have a really good year. Now those sectors are closed for business, and the employees are furloughed or even unemployed entirely. Governments all over our world are responding to this and other key sectors where layoffs are happening. In America, tax rebates of at least $1,000 per household are being debated in Congress. Other countries are debating similar plans. It's only for the duration of the crisis, and yeah, it's socialistic. But these payments are going to be critical support for people who have just lost their income. So long as it is limited to the crisis, I fully support this measure. The reality is that support payments cannot be sustained indefinitely, though. There is no new income stream to fund them, which means that the governments are effectively borrowing this money, and it has to be paid back. Necessary measures, right? We need to survive the crisis first, including keeping as many businesses as possible alive and kicking for when the crisis subsides. That still leaves a lot of people in an awkward position right now. Families are being forced together day and night due to remote working, remote schooling, unemployment, and isolation due to the disease. Many of them are discovering the unique dynamic of continuous close company with each other. It's something akin to the temporary dynamic which exists during the holidays, when school is out and vacations are taken from work to go visiting distant relatives. Except that there is no visiting, no traveling, no hanging out with Uncle Floyd and Aunt Eunice. No, it's just a few days once a year. Can't you behave? I've already seen sign that parents have a newfound appreciation for two things related to education, teacher pay and curriculum. After the crisis subsides, I'd bet that school board meetings become pretty spirited. Many parents are realizing that the lessons their children have to complete during this extended period of distance learning are not as hard as the lessons they remember from their own days in school. But others are learning that they don't remember enough of those lessons to help their kids with their homework. It's quite an eye-opener, isn't it? I'm also seeing more and more people reconnecting with family and friends over cell phones and social media. 
For that matter, social media is rapidly becoming even more critical as a means of exchanging information. Government press conferences and religious services are being live-streamed on YouTube. Twitter is chirping with shared articles and shared opinions. People who have never logged onto a computer if they didn't have to are creating Facebook pages and connecting with each other. This highlights two important industries which many people ignore, the tech industry and the space industry. Much of the computer hardware produced in this world is made in China, and due to their own outbreak, that industry has largely lain idle for two months straight. What's more, those idle months coincided exactly with when the factories reconfigured their manufacturing for new components after the Chinese New Year. Add to that a bottleneck in transportation, largely because shipping computer components is not as important as shipping basic commodities and critical medical products, and we can now expect a six-month delay, at least, in the normal tech manufacturing cycle. Now couple that with the inevitable jump in demand for tech components due to everyone working, shopping, visiting, and entertaining themselves using their computers, and the critical need to spread out tech manufacturing globally becomes readily apparent. I expect over the next 18 months or so that tech factories will spring up all over the globe in order to prevent outbreaks from interrupting the supply chain. As for the space industry, there is a huge demand for internet connectivity right now. Most global communications pass through a relatively sparse constellation of communication satellites. Now, more than ever, we can see the need for a global satellite-based internet service network, like SpaceX's Starlink satellites. Elon Musk currently plans to put about 42,000 relay satellites into orbit to blanket the globe with internet connectivity. At 60 satellites per launch, it will take about 700 launches to get them all up there, and that's just the beginning. Starlink satellites are designed to safely deorbit in six or seven years when their service life is up, meaning that booster flights to replace part of the Starlink constellation will continue for the foreseeable future. So far, just 300 or so satellites are in orbit and operational. Let's hope that SpaceX is able to maintain their launch schedule and keep spreading this network. Elon Musk plans to have the entire network deployed in the next six to nine years. Imagine that. Global internet access, even in the middle of the Sahara Desert or the Pacific Ocean. Life goes on. Innovation continues. The world is still ticking over, even though most of us are wondering when full normalcy will return. Be safe, folks. Be smart. Follow the instructions provided by the WHO, the CDC, and other national and local health centers. And be good to each other. We could all use a little less trolling and a little more cheer right now.